Good day. For those of you who do not know us, we're the instructional staff for ECE 150, professors here in Patel and Werner Dietl, and Douglas Harder. In this topic, we're going to describe literal data. In this topic, we will define literal data and then describe integers, characters, strings, floating point numbers or floats, and Boolean values. Now, we must often hard code actual data into our programs. Any hard coded values are called literals. That is, they are literally what they appear to represent. We have already seen the literal integer 0, and we have seen a literal phrase, specifically, hello world. There are five types of literal data. Integer, character, string, floating point number, and boolean. Now, we have already seen a literal integer in the statement return zero. Zero, or any sequence of decimal digits not starting with a zero, is always interpreted as a decimal integer literal. This number can be prefixed either with a plus or a minus. So all of the following are literal integers. In the first column, other than negative zero, which equals zero, the other, the balance, represent negative integers. In the center and the right column, those represent, other than zero again, positive integers. The plus in front is not necessary, but C++ does allow it. All right, here is a program that begins by printing to the screen the string. The answer to the ultimate question is... Then we print to the screen the literal integer 42 and then an end-of-line character. So if we were to compile and execute this program, or in your IDE or in your online environment, select Run, this will result in the output. The answer to the ultimate question is 42. We could also have this program written as follows, and the output will be the same. The string is printed, followed by 42, followed by the end-of-line character. Now, a book is nothing more than a sequence of letters, numbers, or punctuation, and all of these symbols together are collectively called characters. There are two common representations of characters in C++. The most common is ASCII. Uh, that stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. The second is Unicode. Now, ASCII is limited to 128 characters stored in a single byte. 95 of these characters can be used to print something to the screen. And as you can see, the choice of letters is rather restricted to only those letters that appear in the English alphabet, Latin, and a few other languages in the world that were devised in the 1800s. Almost no other language is restricted to using only these characters. So ASCII itself is more or less restricted to the English-speaking world and the Vatican. 33 of these characters store non-printing control characters, such as a tab, which has to be interpreted, a backspace, a carriage return, a bell, or a delete character. Now, most keyboards today include all 95 printable ASCII characters and some of the control characters, such as tab and carriage return and backspace. The blank, the tab, the new line characters are all collectively referred to as white space characters. 
and you can read more about ASCII on the corresponding Wikipedia page. Unicode, on the other hand, is designed to encode most writing systems today, except for Tolkien's. But aside from that, Unicode 11.0 contains well over 100,000 characters, it covers 146 modern and historic scripts, and it also includes symbol sets such as mathematical symbols and emojis. However, Unicode is significantly beyond the scope of this course. However, you're welcome to look into this on your own. Now, printing characters, that is, those that appear on your ASCII keyboard, can be literally encoded in your C++ co source code by using single quotes. So, for example, first we would print to the console the character A, then the character B, then the character C, and then an end-of-line character. The output to this program would be the follows. Now, if we were to print an end-of-line character after having printed each of those characters, the output would appear as follows. A followed by a new line character, which goes on to the next line, then the B, and so on and so forth. Now, you could print the original version as follows. You could print A, B, and C using a single C out statement, and the output would remain the same. Now, here's an interesting little problem. How do you store a literal single quote? You cannot use a quote surrounded by two quotes because the language, once it sees an opening quote, it recognizes that a character is coming up and then it will continue looking for information until it comes to a closing quote. But what happens here is it interprets the second quote as the closing quote, which causes a compile time error. So the solution to this is to use something called an escape sequence, and this is used throughout programming. An escape character indicates that the next character is meant to be interpreted differently than normal. For C++, the escape character is the backslash. All right. Let's see how that works. The compiler, if you were to escape the single quote, then it sees a quote, but then it sees an escape character which says, don't interpret this as a C++ character for a quote, but interpret it as the character quote, the ASCII character. Then the end of the character is represented by another single quote. If you wanted a backslash, you'd have to code a literal backslash using the backslash as an escape character. The tab character is coded with an escaped T. Here's something else. The ASCII representation was originally designed for teletype machines. These were essentially automatic typewriters. Now, the carriage return, or CR, control character, moved the head back to the start of the line, and the line feed control character, backslash N, rotated the roller to the next line. This is the new line character. Back in the old days of the teletype machines, if you wanted to go to the start of the next line, you had to send both a carriage return and a line feed character. So you had to send two characters. Now, computer screens automatically go to the start of the next line when you hit a new line or line feed. Now, Unix chose the new line or line feed character rather than requiring both. The classic Mac OS from decades ago actually originally chose the carriage return character only. Microsoft DOS kept both, 
you had to send both characters. This caused compatibility and portability issues. In C, your output actually depended on which platform you were writing for. So on Unix, Linux, or Mac OS, if you wanted to print an end of line character, you would print hello world backslash n. In the classic Mac OS, you had to print hello world backslash r. And on Microsoft DOS, you had to have hello world backslash r backslash n. To avoid this, C++ introduced a standard end of line character and then the compiler decided how to code that end of line character depending on which operating system you were currently using. Next we're going to look at string literals. A sequence of characters is also described as a string of characters, that is they're strung together. Consequently such information is referred to as a string. Now, when we include the string hello world directly in our source code, we call this a string literal. This is literally the string of characters to be used when, for example, printing something to the screen. A string encompasses all characters after an opening double quote up to the character just before a closing double quote. And this closing double quote must be on the same line as the opening double quote. Now, it's important to remember that a string with a single character in it is not a character. A in single quotes is the character A. A in double quotes is a string containing a single character which happens to be A. Notice that if you have a double quote immediately followed by another double quote, this represents the empty string. That is, a string that has no characters in it. This is sometimes actually useful. However, there is no such thing as an empty character. Either you have a character or you do not, but you cannot have an empty character, just like a blank does not represent an empty number. However, a string is a sequence of zero or more characters that are strung together. The escape character for C++ strings is also the backslash. So, if we wanted to display a quote inside a string, we would escape the double quote with a backslash. So the output of this statement would be, she said, quote, hello world, unquote. By the way, it's quote, hello world, unquote, not quote, unquote, hello world. Consequently, if you wanted to have a string with a backslash, you would have to escape that backslash. So in this case, here we have a backslash users backslash DW harder. So only one is actually printed to the screen. And in fact, after the compiler has looked through the string, the backslash is stored only as a single character. If you wanted to have tab characters, you could use them as well. So the output of this would be as follows, where the purple lines indicate the tab stops. And so technically the tab character is a non-printing character because it has to sort of be interpreted appropriately before it appears on the screen. Now, Next, we're going to look at literal floating point numbers. Now, real numbers may have an arbitrary number of decimal points. Pi, square root of 2 are all irrational, and so therefore, there is no way to represent 
either of these numbers with a finite number of digits. Here we see pi to 769 digits of precision. We could probably truncate that at the last 3, 4, at 3, 5, probably. Uh, but anyway, point being, given the radius of the universe, you only need 30 digits of pi to calculate the circumference of the universe to the closest millimeter. So you really don't need that much precision in your real numbers. So consequently, we can only store a finite number of digits of precision relative to the actual value of a real number. We will call any such representation floating point. Now, we'll discuss the representation of floating point numbers in the computer in a subsequent lecture. But at this point, we're going to discuss literal floating point numbers. Basically, any sequence of digits that has a decimal point somewhere in them is considered to be a floating point literal. And these numbers can be prefixed by either a plus or a minus. So all of the examples you see below are completely valid floating point numbers. You can also represent any of the previous numbers on the previous slide or an integer multiplied by 10 to the n, where n is any integer, by appending e with that integer. So if you take a look at these, in the first column, it is all of those numbers times 10 to the 5. The second column is each of those numbers times 10 to the 3. The third column is each of those numbers times 10 to the negative 5. The fourth column is all of those numbers times 10 to the 12. And the last column are those integers times 10 to the negative 3. But of course, they will be represented or interpreted as floating point numbers. Now, some of these seem a little bit bizarre. The most common use of this format is, of course, scientific notation. So here we see the standard representation of the Planck constant, the speed of light, and the Avogadro constant. Now, printing of floating point numbers is slightly different from other literals. The output is attempted to be made a little bit more elegant. So there are no unnecessary trailing zeros. So 3.0 is essentially the integer 3, and so it actually prints as 3, not 3.0 or 3.000. Following this, same for 3.14, and if you have any more digits than that, it usually truncates at 6 digits. You can actually change this, but that's beyond the scope of this particular talk. Now, the last category of literals in C++ are Boolean literals. There's true and false. So some condition may be true or false, and we can compare it with these values, but these are the literal Boolean values that the computer considers true and false. And as you can see from the output, they're actually represented internally, not as a sequence of characters, but rather as ones and z a one and a zero, respectively. Following this topic, you now understand the idea of having literal data in your source code. You know how to include in your source code literal integers, characters, strings, floating point numbers, and Boolean values. These are the only literal pieces of data that you can include in your source code. So you now have a comprehensive understanding of what is available. In subsequent topics, we will also see how we can access such data from other sources such as the keyboard or files. Here are the references, acknowledgments, 
the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers! <laughs>